uh, let me introduce our panel. We have Mark Sherwood. He is um, the Senior Director of Emerging Technology at, in the IT Group at Cisco. Brian Walls, NASA Web Video Working Chair. We have Jeff Miller, Digital Communication and Delivery Specialist at Toyota. And Andrea Doan, Manager Co Employee Communications at GE. Help me welcome our panel. They're here today to share what they've learned so far on how to recommend mix of technologies for events and, and talk a little bit about the work that they're doing on making their technologies work better together. Um, so I'm going to ask them to each um, give you a two minute introduction so that you can get a nice picture of what their um, operations do and how they, um, the types of technologies that they're working on. Mark? I'll actually try and keep this less than two minutes. So uh, my name is Mark Sherwood. I work at Cisco Systems. Uh, part of the Unified Communications and Video Services IT group, so responsible really for anything audio or video within the company. So it, it's, it's anything rolling out all of the uh, video endpoints, all the audio endpoints, and then um, specific to kind of this meeting, anything around video streaming, so VOD or live streaming, anything from audiences to of 10 people up to audiences of 100,000 people with varying types of, of technology in between. Probably from my side, you won't hear an awful lot about a mix of technologies, not surprisingly. Most of what we have internally is Cisco. Uh, but I'll, I'm happy to share whatever we have. And uh, I'm not here to try and necessarily sell anything and just let you know what, uh, what works from our side and, what, and I'll tell you honestly what things that haven't worked. Great. Brian? So I'm Brian Walls. I'm from NASA. I've been an engineer with NASA for 26 years now. This year I took a new position as the Deputy Program Manager of the Digital TV Program at NASA. Um, the Digital TV Program, DTV, was originally um, <clears throat> instituted to do our analog television infrastructure transition to digital and then on to HD. But last year its scope was expanded to include web video all across the agency. And NASA has 11 different field centers, if you count headquarters in Washington and JPL over in Pasadena. Each of them's a bit of an independent organization. Um, so my main function as the deputy is the, the Web Video Working Group chairman. And the core of that Web Video Working Group is a representative at each of the 11 centers plus um, reps from our CIO and public affairs offices. We have a couple of them out in the audience, actually. Um, so we are working on some standardization, working together. We have a significant diversity of tools that we use uh, across the agency, but we're working on coming together to, to some standards to better share and, and cut costs. Uh, prior to this job, I was the lead engineer for streaming at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, so I've got a bit of an overview as well as a bit more specific uh, into the technology in that one place. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Jeff. Good morning. I'm Jeff Miller. I am uh, a contractor at, contractor at uh, Toyota Motor Sales uh, based out of our headquarters in Torrance. It's about uh, 20 miles south of here. Um, I work at the Video Production Center, which is in the Corporate Communications Division. Um, and I was hired in 2007 to run the existing satellite network. Um, Toyota had um, a, a, this network that had existed for about 20 years and uh, I didn't have any satellite network experience under my belt but I had a back, background in film and video. So I uh, took the position and um, about two years after I started it um, we decided that we would start looking at uh, different alternatives. Um, wasn't quite giving us what we wanted as far as the live um, broadcast and that kind of thing. Um, so about 18 months ago, uh, we developed a team that um, did some research on streaming media vendors and um, eventually contracted with Accordion Technologies, which is now owned by Poly Polycom. And then a year ago, almost to the day from today, um, we had our first live webcast on the new system um, to our headquarters associates, about 4,000 or so. Um, since then, over this last year, we've, we've grown quite a bit um, in addition to our internal system. Um, just webcasting to our, our headquarters associates, we've um, expanded that to reach about 35 of our field offices uh, so we can reach them live. Um, 
And then uh, we're planned to do about another 40 or so in the next six months. So it's, it's, it's constantly growing. Um, in addition, we've I implemented a cloud-based instance of our system um, to reach the public and the media outlets, as well as um, in August, we started a dealer network so we can deliver content to our 235 of our Lexus dealers. Um, the project's called Lexus TV, and currently it's um, only delivering back-of-house associate-type content training, that kind of thing. But the plan is to um, create a customer-facing version in the next year or so. So uh, we're excited about that as well. Overall, it's been an exciting year. Um, I have learned a lot. Um, by no means am I an expert in this. Um, it, probably to many of you, I'm, I'm sort of a noob because I've only been here for about a year. But um, anyways, we, you know, we've learned a lot. And if I can share any of that with any of you today, I'd, that'd be great. So thanks for having me. The noobs have a great way of looking at things <laughs> differently. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah. Andrea. Yeah, so um, you, you may be new, but I probably have the least you know, <laughs> amount of uh, technology uh, background per se. I'm um, Andrea Dona. I'm part of the corporate communications team at, at GE Corporate based in, um, based in Connecticut. Uh, so uh, most people I probably suspect will, will know GE. I think uh, we definitely have the, the luck of, of that side. We have 300,000 employees around the world in more than 100 locations. And so when we talk about communications to them, um, there's definitely uh, an emphasis on technology, but what could be unique to probably our perspective and, and, and could be a good thing is that it's, it can never be all about technology. So about half of our employees are not in front of a computer. Um, those that are in front of a computer, there's very little control over what they have. So sometimes we have challenging uh, situations that we need to overcome for, and sometimes they're not challenging, like things like they just don't have speakers. Um, but when you talk about volume of 300,000 around the world, um, it, it definitely provides both challenges and, and opportunities from a technology perspective. I don't think we have a unique uh, a, a unique solution, but I'm happy to share any stories that um, any of our experiences that we have. That's what we're looking for. It'll be great. So you've heard an interesting mix of technologies and um, and and some not, uh, and and just some you know needs assessments of how we're going to tackle a problem, and that's what we want to get at today. So let's start with the client conversation. They get the call. We've scheduled a town hall, and we want everybody in the world to see it. So each of you panelists, give us some advice on how you, you guide the conversation to get at what you need to know to recommend a solution. And we're going to start with Brian. Well, let's start out with three basic questions. One is, where is the event going to be held? Two is, who is your target audience? And three is, how does your funding look? Uh, so for the first one, where the event is held, we basically have three different possibilities there. NASA has a rich video background and traditional video, so almost every center either has or has access to professional videographers. Um, and we have an infrastructure there Usually there's a studio, there's somewhere you can go to do a press event. Usually there's a big auditorium. If you're in one of those locations, you can tie directly into our studio. Uh, normally it's HD going straight to a switcher, and we can do the encode from the studio. So if you're in that case, that's the easiest for us. Um, next, if you're on our internal network, you may be out somewhere else, but you're still on our um, internal LAN on one of our centers. That's pretty easy because we can get out there, we can do the encode in place um, and go out. That's pretty easy. Next one is anywhere else. Uh, if you're outside, it's harder. That's a whole different thing you have to look at. How do we get back? How do we get back through our firewalls uh, to us? We can certainly do that, but, but I'm going to have to hook the user up with somebody. Maybe we'll do a satellite truck. We may do a data uplink or we have to acquire. Um, network wherever we're going to be. Who is your target audience? If it's everybody in the world, we're actually pretty good at that because we have um, NASA TV has three channels that are constantly streaming out through www.nasa.gov. Uh, we're going to satellite so people can pick it up with a satellite dish. If it's a big enough event, then we'll put it on NASA TV and that's easy. We're already streaming it 24-7. If it's a, limited to a single center, every center knows how to do outreach within the center. Some of them are still using analog cable as their main thing and people go to a TV um, and 
have some unicast streams, but not everybody can see it on their desktop. Quite a few of us have IPTV type systems, uh, like an OptiBase <coughs> system that's multicasting and everybody can get HD on their desktop internally. For us, the most, well, more challenging for us is to go to all of NASA because we don't do that often enough that it's, it's kind of hard to do that. We have ways to do that. We have a, a video infrastructure that can multicast out to everybody and then they can pick it up from there. So we do it fairly well, but we have to think about it when we're doing that. Um, for funding, I'm not directly involved with the funding, but it does make a difference when I'm talking to somebody. If they have money, obviously there are more options and it's easier. Uh, we're, we have some infrastructure capability, but it's really being trimmed down. Um, in my 26 years at NASA, I've never <coughs> seen it as tight as, you know, just it's really tough. Um, the infrastructure especially, all of that is, is the first place you're going to cut, and it's the second and third, and we're into the fourth or fifth now. So it, that, that has really been tight. Um, and one of the struggles that we have, I'll mention with the money, is that often even if we're doing an infrastructure thing, what we don't have built-in infrastructure for is doing captioning, which is a legal requirement on the government. So almost always we're going out of house for that, and if we can say, okay, we can do this event for you, but you're going to have to pay X amount for us to pull this in. That has been a struggle for us that we're trying to figure out how to make easier. Right. Thank you, Brian. Jeff, um, we've got where, who, and how's your wallet, or what's in your wallet. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and then and uh, talking about blended solutions and all that. Talk some more about blended solutions and how you um, uh, talk with your customers about sure. you know, um, how, how you're going to cover the event. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, we do, uh, my first question always is who is the audience and who, who are we delivering to because it tells me a lot about what sort of, um, what system I'm putting it on, if it's internal or external or sometimes both. Um, it tells me what sort of format if we're delivering to Lexus.com or Toyota.com. I know that's a flash stream. Um, if it's internal, our IS guys don't care for flash, so we do WMV internal. Um, it also, uh, I also handle um, the production management and the um, the project stuff at um, Toyota. So um, I start thinking about the production requirements. Is this a two camera shoot? Is this a, you know, um, do I need a live switch? How much engineering support? That kind of stuff. And then also tells me which sort of um, internal or external departments I need to work with. Um, if I need to work with the marketing team or if it's a, a Toyota.com event, do I need to deal with the agency and, and who do I need to engage with? Um, and then we move by, by you know, some of the other who, what, where, when, that things. Um, but the, the the biggest thing that for our clients, anyways, uh, you know, webcasting is not is is not a Toyota's core business. So um, half, or maybe even more than half, of our clients that come in um, that want to do a webcast don't have any experience with video production, let alone live streaming event or anything like that. So um, I spend a lot of time trying to basically translate the technical stuff into something that's a little bit more digestible for someone that's never even experienced it before. So um, and I feel like doing it that way, um, we've seen some success with people being more interested in collaborating. I'm a big proponent of collaboration and working together to try to make projects successful. So um, that translation in, uh, for the business units is, is, um, is key and it's, and it's helped us quite a bit. Um, and not only does it build trust for the project, but I also have to think about our department, so it helps bring people back more for, for our department for other projects as well. So, um, And because we're so new, um, the conversation almost always leads to some, some place that we've never been before. Um, so I try to have our partner, uh, someone from Polycom, in the room with me, or at least on the phone, so that, you know, if there's a question that comes up that I have no idea, that for instance, we had a client that wanted to, to do live stream on Facebook, and that's not something we'd done before. So um, I had the partner with me, so that, that helped, um, you know, answer some of those questions. But you know, that happens all the time. So trying to give them an answer quickly and um, you know something that is relevant to to their project, I, I think helps quite a bit as well. So 
Thank you, Jeff. Andrew, you come at it from the line of business side, and so when someone presents these options to you and everything, tell me what you're thinking about around the message and the challenges that you see from the business side of getting your message across using uh, various channels. Yeah, I mean, I think probably both from the, the business side and maybe a question uh, that, that we haven't addressed yet is also how soon. Um, so being part one. of the corporate communications uh, team and being very close to, to things that are happening, things that need to be responded to, um, it's, a, it's a big difference of pros and cons as to what we're thinking about if I need it tomorrow, mm -hmm. <laughs> if I need it three months from, from now. So I guess... Um, really it, good point. And, and I think along those same lines, as, as I think about it from a communication standpoint, what are the gives and takes? What are we willing to accept at, at this stage? Um, and, and what does success look like? You know, for us, as we think about um, can, can we reach all these employees, for us, that's never a question because with employees and all the time zones that we have, we're never, we can't reach all of our employees, even if everyone did have, you know, some type of a, tech, a technological or mobile device in front of them. Mm -hmm. So trying to think about it and, and flexible, which I think is the, the, the question that you were talking about, being as flexible as we can, being as creative as we can to reach employees no matter how. You, I was really surprised. I've, I've only been at GE for two years. Early on, I was very surprised at how many employees watch our, um, our videos and, and, um, or our live events on replay. And it kind of, it was strange to me because there's always an executive who's hosting questions and, and you know, being very interactive. But you know, we get two times the viewership on replay. But when you think about where our employees are, whether they're part of the sales force from a functional standpoint, functional stand they might be on the sales force, they might be in a hospital repairing an MRI, right? So understanding that that's okay, right? Reaching employees where they are is much more important than reaching them all at the same moment for us. And so thinking creatively within that space is really important for us. That's excellent, Andrew. You and I are sisters from different mothers because that, you know, communicating with people where they are and how they want to receive the message is, is what drives the line of business and, and drives our partnership here. Thanks. Mark, talk about a little bit within Cisco how, um, how these questions get answered, and I love how soon. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and so I think you know, a lot of my answers are probably in line with a lot of what you've just heard. Certainly, uh, I think we probably start out with money, maybe rather than ask it for the third question. But in general, so we used to be very ad hoc in terms of the way we approached this. There were a few people everybody knew, you know, within a certain number of teams. Hey, we got a meeting coming up, it's, you know, and it's going to go out to 10,000 people. It's going to come up, you know, in, in a couple of days. What can we do? How can we get it going? So we learned, you know, over time that it really made sense. We built a portal out there that allows anybody to go internal to Cisco and access it. That basically gives them, you know, the kind of the, the understanding. First, there's a couple of very simple boxes to fill out that says, what is the event? Basically, what's your audience like? What's the time frame like? What are your expectations? What do you need? What do you think you need? Um, and then, you know, it, it basically allows you to look at some internal options that we have. So for a much smaller event, you know, we've got the, a WebEx, so you can do a meeting center, you can do an event center, you can do a hosted event center, and then you can move up into like an actual Cisco studio. You can use one of the small studios, you can use the big studios, you can go studios across the world, um, you can bring in telepresence, um, and then it starts to add in basic, kind of basic costs around that structure as well as how much time we need in order to be able to organize something like this. The other things that we've also added in now are if you want to have slides, if you want to have remote speakers join, if you want to have them join on audio, if you want to have them join on video. And then one of the latest things we've added over the last year or so is the ability to add in a chat feature while the event's ongoing, and that's become wildly popular in the company. Both We started it out with just kind of a freeform chat. It's a Cisco Jabber, if you've heard of that. Uh, and we also do a moderated chat now. So there's actually two chat windows, and our first thought was, wow, this is going to be confusing and complex, and people aren't going to like it. But now we've tried it without them, and everybody complains that they don't some people love the moderated one, and that's basically where you've got maybe a set of uh, people that are actually running the event. Maybe you've got a business unit or you've got a set of executives out there answering questions that maybe the speakers or the presenters aren't. And then there's a, the unmoderated chat, which is just people saying, hey, that was a great point, or wow, that guy's suit looks bad, or whatever. So people are pretty open. But it, it tends to get the audience much more engaged instead of sitting out there, you know, kind of just dull, you know, watching a, a, a recording or watching a, a live stream. You actually have people participating. They get feedback from, from friends, from partners, whatever, um, throughout the company to be able to say, hey, you know, when is that date? I didn't hear them announce the date. Well, the, we heard this date's going to slip, or we heard this one's right on time. So both of those, I'd say, is probably equally popular, but that's something where everybody wants it now. So that's kind of been the big change, I guess, in what we've seen over the last probably six to nine months is the popularity of having that chat feature along with the live streaming concepts.
Excellent. Mark, thanks for um, getting us kind of moving toward the, the, the technology itself. Um, what I'd like to do now is dig a little deeper into engaging technology partners. A lot of, some of you are moving into overall strategy like we are at, at Wells Fargo, and some of you are on point for the whole thing. Um, some of you depend on the, the technology partners to figure out how to herd the cats. And that's really what, I, what I'd like to hear from you. And Jeff, I'd like to start with you um, talking about best practices for negotiating with partners or, or getting everybody to land all at the same time? Yeah, sure. So um, I was involved when we decided in, in, with the team that we did the research and, and our original talks with um, Accordant and also when they got bought by Polycom, they brought in another team. So we've had a lot of discussion about our relationship with them. Um, but I think they, you know, it maybe kind of gets overlooked, but the, the key word in this is partner. And, um, you know, I didn't want... Uh, a vendor to come in and drop off a couple of encoders, a server, and email me a license, and then a couple of phone calls and say, this is how you do it. We wanted somebody that was going to integrate with us, and so I harp on it all the time with them about having a partnership and and creating this system that can be the, the, the best it can be. Um, we have, uh, we've, we've done a lot in the last year, but we have a long way to go, and, and so I, we have to count on them being that partner to, you know, tell us if what the best practices are. If, you know, they're maybe more in touch with, with some of the technology advancements and that kind of stuff than we are. Um, but, um, you know, if there's something that they're doing that, that maybe don't, won't work with us, to be honest with us about, you know, hey, this is not going to work for you, but we have another option, um, that kind of stuff, thing. So, I mean, it's really, to me, it's really about partners. And, and, you know, I'm not buying a cell phone from them. I'm buying a system that thousands of our associates count on for it to just work and they they look at me and my team to 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 make that happen so having that support from from according to uh, polycom now is um is a big deal to us so it's huge yeah it's huge yeah so andrea um she does talk a little bit about technology she does have um uh, an example here. Um, talk about a little bit about how um, this particular technology, this is a, a virtual town hall kind of thing and Wells Fargo is looking at it too. I think there's a lot of interest in the enterprise right now around this. Yeah, and this is a particular example that, um, that I brought. This is uh, certainly a little bit more of, a, of an expertise around this, but we had a challenge. We have um, a global day of health. If any of you work in manufacturing facilities, you know about stand downs for safety. Well, we do a stand down for, for health at GE. And on a typical uh, year, this was the second one that we did, um, what we try to do is we find a global program that you know unites our employees together that really supports local on the ground activities. And so we choose a day throughout the year and on the ground what you have are sites that are doing things like fitness education and awareness around stress management. And, and there's a very broad range of topics that they'll cover, all very hands on on the site. Some of them go hog wild, they take a week. Um, but at a minimum we ask sites to take a couple hours, but we always want employees to feel as though they're part of their site activity but they're part of the larger GE. When you have 300,000 employees, sometimes they feel as though they're not connected to the whole. And so we were looking for a solution this year. Um, and I talked a little bit about the global challenge that we have. But we wanted to show the uniqueness of this program. Every country is, is unique um, when you think about something like health, because it's so personal. And so we had this concept. It was. Um, uh, we, we called it Health Ahead Around the World, and thinking about the time zones, uh, the concept was to take a certain segment of programming in different countries and move around the world in 24 hours and allow them to own their space with videos. And here you see, I think we're in the English uh, site right now, you'll see videos in the native language on the right. Um, the videos would start to play in that center screen. And then we'd have local experts who would host chats on the bottom. I think this gets right to, to um, the point that, that you were talking about mm -hmm. earlier, the social layer um, and how that comes about. And so we, um, uh, we sought partners uh, outside, of, uh, outside of GE, and this was uh, designed by um, some, uh, our colleagues at E.B. Clark and Myler, um, who are with us. We also have internal um, uh, IT experts. We have intern networking experts. And what we seek for in a partner, which is very much like you, is, is someone who kind of comes in, sits with us, and they're our partners side by side. We, um, this, this was amazing. What amazed us about this particular day um, was the amount, we didn't have as many people joining as we had expected. I think it was like in the 10 or 20,000 employees who joined, but those who joined were highly engaged. They were chatting, they were liking things, they were watching videos. On average, they watched um, 
gosh, I forgot what the number was. I think it was between three and four videos uh, per employee who joined. And so we were pretty excited about this. You can see the flags up on the top. That's how you moved around the country. Each country had its own space. It was fully translated, which was, you know, in, in part um, a little bit of a nightmare, I'm sure, uh, sure. My, <laughs> my colleagues uh, uh, could, could understand that. And we also obviously had very strong partners in the countries uh, themselves because they were helping us with the translations and the videos and really bringing the elements together. But it worked for us, and, and so much so that, that it's definitely a model that we're thinking about, um, either for a general town hall, and actually we're working um, with our colleagues at BBA as well on a, on a possible town hall project that we're thinking of to bring more employees into this space, to learn, uh, to be with an executive, um, and then to chat and have a conversation. Awesome, good. Mark, you're, you're the king of integration over there. Mm -hmm. That's the, the, you know, the, the thing that, that you guys think about. When you mm -hmm. see something like this or a new idea that your line of business comes to, some line of business comes to you, how do you, how do you integrate it within the unique situation that you have? Yeah, so the, the, I think one of the challenges we have is that from a Cisco on Cisco perspective, which is you know, this, this internal goal that we're basically running all the products before they're actually sold, so we're running them in our own networks. Um, is that we're, you know, we have that saying that says we're kind of trying to change the tires while the car's driving down the road. It says we're trying to provide these services, but at the same time, you know, we get pushed from all the business units and the technology groups to go, I've got new cool stuff and you should roll it out. And just because no customer's ready to take it yet because it's not, you know, FCS first customer ship yet, it doesn't matter. You guys should take it, start running it because we really want to get your feedback. So we're, we're kind of always on the edge of, of trying to stay as current as we can with the technology that's released inside the company and yet still provide hopefully a consistent positive user experience for all the events that we run. So from a partnering standpoint, we do a lot of this stuff internally as you probably would guess. We have partnered with some other outside companies for some much broader events. We do a, a yearly strategic leadership offsite. Uh, we also do a global sales meeting. There's probably 25,000 salespeople at Cisco. So those things, we're, we're slowly bringing those all in-house because we realize that we really have all the technology and by this time a lot of the know-how to be able to run this on some of our own platforms. So I say that's been, that's been a big push internally is to say we want to be able to continue to, to have those kinds of platforms so that we can, we can drive it as an internal team instead of having to continue to go and leverage outside. But for us, it's always trying to push, you know, if, if we hear a request that isn't in line, kind of, and that's almost how we got started with the, the concept of the chat features, we started to have some requests around obviously the kind of the impact on the social networking that says it, it really adds so much to the session when people are really involved and you it's so different from being in a live session where you're physically there and maybe you had to travel to get there and you're motivated and you have networking in the evening and everything. When you're watching a live video event, right, you, you tend to right what's happened, right? You're 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 back to your, your your mobile phone, right? You're back to your email, whatever. You get distracted pretty easily because we all do, right? We're all trying to multitask, say we're we're gonna pay attention to this, but I'm also gonna do email at the same time. The good thing about the chat sessions for us is they really do keep people more engaged and we get a lot more comments back saying, you know, we're 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 trying to kind of marry that the technology but also the human side of it. It isn't, you know, it isn't just about the technology. Obviously, having that technology work and be reliable is a big part of it. But without that kind of human connection and interaction, which some of those social media tools bring along, um, that's really what's added the, the, the advantage there. We've also got some where we're, we're now adding um, kind of like breakout sessions, kind of like a virtual breakout session where we'll say, you know, you want to go and establish like, a, like you know, through, through WebEx, we'll go kick off a session and these eight people maybe want to break out and they want to talk about something similar. We've just started to do some of those things. But again, it's that idea of saying, how do we how do we kind of get people more engaged in the session so they're not just you know kind of staring blankly at the screen and listening to every third word? So, it's um, it's that humanization of technology. I'd say is kind of our our, our big push forward. Mark, I hope you'll come to tomorrow's session for the webcasting uh, piece of it because our one of our big questions in that is going to be how do you promote the stickiness? How do you yep, keep that's people it. engaged? And so we'll we'll definitely want you to to stand sure. up and help us out with that that, that answer. And Brian. Well, so I mentioned that basically our videography we do internally, um, captioning we've been doing center by center with individual agreements. So it, it's kind of spread around. And, and typically we're doing that on the video, videography side. So they're using traditional, you take a recording, you call your service and then they send it back on a modem and insert it into the video. So it's not really part of our uh, streaming end of things. When you get to encoding, we normally do that internally, but um, 
We have a diverse set of different tools that we use for that. Um, one of the most common is we use TriCasters uh, a lot of the time if we're out in the field. Um, that's one of the more common. And then we have for the NASA TV, um, the 24-7 streams, we're using the Cisco's inlet encoders. Uh, for the most part, uh, we're also doing some of that with Niagara boxes that we've built up ourselves and are running. Um, for distribution, if we're going outside of our own network, when we're going out publicly, uh, we have a contract with eTouch currently, and they have a sub with Akamai, so that's actu actually our main distribution provider. We have a, a fixed amount of bandwidth that we have, and we're pushing up against that with our, our NASA TV. As we've gone to higher quality, uh, we have moved to um, adaptive flash, made that available as well as the iPhone, and usage has gone way up. Uh, so we're close to filling that pipe. We also have an agreement with Ustream, uh, which has worked out nicely. They include the chat type capability. Uh, we're using that quite a lot doing for events where we're doing, um, they call them tweet ups. So they invite a group of um, people who have Twitter followers. We let a certain amount come to an event. Uh, and, and do live video on that. We can also do other events, and each center can do that itself without having a lot of overhead. Uh, all they need is a TriCaster wherever they are. They can go to Ustream and, and put things out to the public. So uh, we found that to work well as well. So you've, you've got this mix of technologies and everything. So you're basically deciding sort of a la carte based on the event, the audience and everything, which of these different... Um, we do, and it also depends on where on which First center time. because yeah. each one has their own stack of ways that they've I done see. things. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that in, in my own mind. So, so basically what we've come up here with this is as far as the partnership and consulting, consulting is very, very welcome and I'll say that, that that's, I think that's true across the board. If you are a technology partner, the line of business or we really want to hear from you what can be done, what can't be done, is something better or, or worse for that to support the message. Uh, engaging new technology and then, of course, the, the um, audience engagement, which we'll talk a lot more about in tomorrow's webcasting session. So thank you for that. Now, here's the, the big um, question, and I'm going to ask it from really from the standpoint of managing expectations. How as the technology folks, how do you manage your line of business expectations? How do you educate your customers in the strengths and weaknesses of the various delivery platforms? And how much do you do that and do you? And so I'm going to start with Andrea and coming from the line of business side, how much of that do you want to hear and what do you really want to know? Yeah, I would say that I, I want to hear a, a lot. I, because in my mind, I need to understand the risks with the different options that we choose. Um, so that I have both the upside and the downside to kind of help set expectations, at least with senior leaders within our organization. Um, and I think one of the greatest challenges within that space, kind of in wanting to know a lot so that I can gauge those, is that we're often speaking different languages. You know, we talked about this mm -hmm. before. I, I said, are you sure you want me on your panel? <laughs> I don't speak the same language. I'm sure I don't have the same experience. But it's really, I need to understand. And I know that in a lot of cases, I've, has, I've, had, I've had to press again and again to really understand what the pros and cons are. And it's not that I don't, it's not that I don't trust our partners, whether they're external or, or internal. But it's just being able to make informed decisions together that's really important, at least from our perspective. Awesome, good. Mark, how, when you hear those types of things, mm -hmm. how do you react? Well, you know, so from an IT perspective, we are, you know, I'll, I'll admit we're geeks to the core, right? I'd, I'd love to just spend the whole day talking about the technology, but it, it really comes down to, you know, are you meeting the expectations that the, the customer has? So again, like I explained, we have a, a portal now that we've developed over time kind of to give people a basic understanding. Here's kind of what you get with each one of these. Which one do you think is right for you? Then we have an opportunity. They go off and there's a, an email alias where they can go and have a discussion with. We'll assign a program manager, especially at some of these broader events. But really from us, it, it's really trying to understand the core. Sometimes what they, they ask for is in, in, uh, slightly different than what they really want. So it's trying to, trying to piece that together to really understand what are their expectations. Because you know, it, may, it may have come across great in my mind, but if it didn't meet their expectations, then in general it's kind of a failure. 
So uh, I would say getting as much information and, and probably in a lot of these bigger events is really sitting down with the, the end consumer to say, here's exactly how we're going to do it. We'll do a basic mock-up. We'll maybe walk them through, help them understand where this, you know, what the studio view is going to be like, what they're going to experience. You know, we have some demos so they can actually experience it from a user perspective to say, yes, that's what I want, or wow, you know, that, that seems like what I want, but that's pretty expensive and we don't have a budget like that. So we have, we have a pretty broad range from, again, relatively, I mean, very, very cheap, I would say, I mean, less than $1,000 for, for even a medium-sized event, up to tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars for these things that may go on for three or four days, big live event, broadcasting from a number of areas, telepresence involved, all the rest of the pieces. Uh, but I'd say the, the really locking in kind of the, the, what the user is really expecting out of this is the key to, to being, you know, for us, being able to have successful events. And, and getting that information out to them to be able to show them the options. And again, it was, it was somewhat informal before. Since we've got to the stage where it's pretty well documented out there, it's gotten through a lot of challenges that we faced early on when the customer would say, wait a minute, that's not what Steve said. Steve said I could have this and go, Okay, well, we'll have to live up to that for now, but documenting has gone a long way for us. Brian, I think NASA's magic. I think that everything happens there by magic, and we all know that's not true. How do you all handle you know, the conversations that you have about setting expectations on what's going to happen with an event? I think a lot of the expectations are that what the customers have seen before, they expect that to work. But then, of course, they're also seeing Facebook and YouTube and are building expectations on that. So there's kind of a negotiation on getting to, to what's actually going to work. A lot of it depends on where you are, you know, the things that I mentioned before, uh, where are you coming from and where are you going to, uh, and what we have available in those places. So th there's a commun sort of an organic communication that's going on there. Mm -hmm. And Jeff, what would you add to that? Well, I mean, I, I think I touched on a little bit earlier, but, you know, um, a lot of our clients don't really understand the video production process, so so kind of doing some of the stuff that uh, Mark was talking about, kind of explaining and and going through the process and getting into like a, a user user friendly mode so that they, they get it. Um, so I think using that as a base. But I mean, um, and then I think the other thing is that you know for us anyways, we have to be aware of our limitations and be okay with saying no, I can't do that at this point, but. We can do it maybe in six months, or we'll work on it, or that kind of thing. Um, I find that um, having that sort of honest relationship with our clients and telling them, "Hey, you know, I'd love to be able to do this for you today, but I can't do it. It'll be a couple months or whatever. Or we'll, or we'll try that kind of thing." Um, really, you know, sets the bar. You know, for me, I've al I've always rather under promise and over deliver than the other way around. It's it's uh, that never works for me. So. Um, uh, the other thing is that at Toyota, and this may be a little bit corny, but the, the, uh, there's a principle at, at Toyota called Kaizen, which is loosely translated to constant improvement. So everybody's aware of it in, in our culture. And so we, we, you know, we're constantly trying to improve our system, and, and we, we kind of go with that, that explanation as well. And it, and it actually gets a lot of traction with our clients. So. Yeah, you know, that's that's a really good point because I, I venture to guess that most of the technology uh, partners um, that are here or around, they choke on no or not yeah. yet. They just can't say it. They just want to find some kind of way. And sometimes that really leads you down the wrong road. Yeah. And as a line of business partners, we have to say, you know, it's really okay. Yeah. You know, we really want to know yeah. uh, what we can do and what yeah. we can't do because that's I, the worst thing you can do is say is have somebody think, oh, well, this, this thing's magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd much rather tell them no and that we're going to work on it than tell them yes and have something fail. So. Yeah. yeah, thanks. So we've done the event. Uh, we have settled kind of everything down. Um, and, and so I'm interested in what kind of post-mortem uh, or follow-ups do you conduct after an event to gather your successes, lessons learned, and improvement opportunities? Do you have any kind of uh, sort of special way of getting at that? And, uh, and then how do you share it back with your partners? And we'll start with Mark. Yeah, first we don't call them post-mortem because it sounds like somebody died. <laughs> so we, we yeah, it's old TV term and sometimes these. people did. <laughs> yeah, we see, so we call them post-event reviews. Um, yeah, we, we actually do them for every single event and it sounds boring and stupid, but it's, it, it's one of those things that we've learned over time that even a small event, right, you've still got somebody who had expectations for an event and they paid money for it and, you know, they, they, they want to make sure their voice is heard. So 
We have some informal ways, right, where um, we'll basically just go and have a discussion if it's a fairly small event with people that we, that we put it on with. For the larger events, it's actually a pretty sophisticated um, survey response that goes out of pick on our sales meeting that goes on the, this, um, we call it um, GSX, the Global Sales uh, Experience. And those are surveys that go out to everybody. And we actually do some, some focus groups, right? We pull some people who are typically, you know, with salespeople, sometimes it's not hard to find ones who are very vocal and want to share their opinions. Uh, so we tend to go out and have those kinds of meetings, get that. We, on some of those, we actually bundle up a review deck, and then that gets sent out to kind of the, the broader audience. So we spend a lot of time going through there, and then we review it internally, right, with no external kind of customers or clients involved to make sure we get an opportunity to look back and say, okay, what went well, what messed up, what almost messed up, right? That's the biggest thing for us is, you know, we have a lot of times it seems like the team, they've done a superior job in fighting fires and, and, and putting them out so that the customers, the clients can't actually see them, but, but we see them. And I'm thinking, you know, this, this, we may not have caught that fire, you know, in, in, in six times out of 10. So it's really trying to understand what it is that either went wrong or, you know, that we covered for or what it, whatever it was that was about to go wrong that uh, we were able to, to you know, get a lid on and say next time we really got to get our arms around some of these things. So, and for us, a lot of that, you know, it, it's been some of the partners that, that we've struggled with. It's, it's not because they're a bad company or they're stupid or anything. It's just the fact that anytime there's new groups involved where you're trying to integrate them, that's part of the job, essentially putting the vent on, but integrating with a number of partners. And I think, you know, when you have the partners, it goes up geometrically, right? You know, one partner has one problem, you get two partners, you got four problems. So any, the, the integration piece, I think, is a lot of the magic in there. So again, one of the reasons why we're pulling a lot of this, this in-house. But yeah, I'd say that you know, the, the, most of the work is done on either side almost. We, we've, we've got most of the infrastructure in place. It's getting an understanding of what the client really wants and then understanding, did we meet their expectations? Do they feel that this was a good experience for them? Brian. I, I think for us, often if it goes okay, we're directly on to the next, you know, working the next job. Um, we don't have a terribly cohesive, well, we don't have any process that's specifically for streaming across the agency. There's different, you know, quality for who's doing the work. Um, I think that's something that we could, could probably improve on to learn more. Now, on our big stuff, you know, as we were doing shuttle launches, shuttle landings, we watched very closely how it was going, and after the fact, we would look at um, what the statistics look like, what went well, what went badly. Um, and then, you know, it's part of the engineering process, so it happens throughout. But um, right now, there's not anything that's in my control that, that's consistent across the agency. Yeah. Jeff? Well, I mean, I think for us, when we first started, this was kind of a hard thing. I, I mean, we wanted to improve on issues, but when you don't have the knowledge of what you need to improve to, it's difficult to kind of put in place, you know, the yes, things sure. that need to, to, to work better. So, um, but over time, as we've kind of done more and more of these, um, we've kind of developed a process, and it's, it's not written in stone or anything, but basically we'll, we'll, the team will meet briefly after an event, um, immediately after an event, to kind of go, go through the checklist of things that maybe went wrong, make sure everybody's on the same page, and then we'll go through and, and maybe create a more comprehensive um, list if, if we feel like you know the issue is you know deserves it. I mean some of the things um, if you've got a floor director who's queuing someone too early or whatever I mean that's sort of a human error that I don't think that really requires a whole lot of you know explanation or hey, someone made a mistake and yeah. we're human so um, but you know any sort of um, strategy or technical issues that that we can you know build on uh, you know we definitely kind of have further discussions about that and and you know, we'll, tr we'll try to take that information and then create a more um, user-friendly document that we can like send to upper management because they want to know, you know, wh why did this not work and, and what are we going to do next time so, so it gets better. So um, that's kind of what we okay. Andrea, how do. Andrea, how do you listen to this and how do you respond to it? What do you want to hear and what are you thinking about? So I would say I have a completely different approach from what went wrong, and that's probably because I'm part of the communications, the public relations, and the marketing team. So my first approach is to always celebrate like what happened well and to make sure as many people know about that so I get additional funding the next time around. <laughs> um, and if things went wrong, I'm good at spin because I'm part of the PR team. <laughs> and so I can always, uh, and, and that's not to say that I'm not interested in fixing it for the next time, but I would say that my initial focus isn't talking about what went right 
um, and where the successes were and how we did accomplish, which goals we did accomplish. And if there weren't goals, I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't, you know, I, I like my job. I, I certainly am, am honest about the things that we could absolutely do better. But I will tell you, my first, um, my first piece will be celebrating all the successes um, and celebrating, you know, the partners that we had along the way because we know, at least from the communication side, that we didn't get it done on our own. <laughs> um, and so we're pretty big at, you know, celebrating those who are with us along the way. Great, thank you. Now it's your turn. We're going to open up the um, floor for questions, and I knew they would just begin to pop up immediately. Just wait for the microphone. Where it's coming around. Oh, all right. Uh, I got a couple of questions. I'm not sure whether I can do all of those. Um, but uh, Brian, a question to you, and also to you, uh, Mark, about um, the live nature of chats, and also Andrea. This uh, probably uh, fits in your area as well. Mixing the fact that you've got live events and how uh, and how great the chat experience is, how does that work in a in a situation where you have a worldwide audience and distributed across time zones and things like that? So that's my first question. How does that all sort of factor into your plans and strategy? Okay, let's grab some answers on that. Well, in our tweet ups, we basically just let the tool run. I know I sometimes watch. And well, so, so our NASA TV is on Ustream as well. So that's 24 7 plus there's the events. And if I go in and look at that, you can see in the chat there'll be stuff going in scripts. It's I have no idea months. what's going. And, and that's fine. We used to be very worried about, oh, what if somebody says something bad? What if somebody says something negative to NASA or says, uses a dirty word? And you know, with Twitter being everywhere, all of the, the text that's constantly running, I think we've just gotten a lot more comfortable with expecting people to take things with a grain of salt uh, and to deal with what they see. Yeah, I would, I would say ours is, is probably pretty close, right? There was, yeah, there's always some general fear that somebody's going to say, you know, effectively something inappropriate, but the thing is we all we all think inappropriate things at times, right? And sometimes that's what's great about social media is it just gets the truth out. Um, people are sometimes brutally honest on that. I mean, I think they've been uh, professional but honest, and I think that's good. I mean, I think it's good for companies. This is just my opinion, right, and kind of the culture at Cisco. You, we have to question what we're doing. Are we doing the right things, right? If, if, if the general population is saying, I don't think that's the right path for the company, right? They, in my mind, they have that right to be able to make that kind of a statement. The other question you said about the different time zones, a lot of the larger meetings will do two of them, so like a two sessions at two different times. One session, you know, it's painful in, in San Jose, you know, because it may be at 10 o'clock at night, but, you know, if this is once a quarter or once every six months, not a big deal. Because if you're watching a VOD, you're, you're, you're not going to get that chat capability, and then we feel like we've left out, you know, half of our, our company. So it's, it's kind of a all hands on deck that says, you know, we're going to put in one big full day and we're going to do two sessions. And you know we're going to get that chat. We're going to have people moderate. This. Again, we, we tend to have the two kinds of moderated and the unmoderated chats. Um, but at least have those people uh, available so that um, everybody can get that kind of an experience instead of just saying, hey, just in the US, sorry for everybody who's on a different time zone. Mm -hmm. Andrew. Yeah, the only thing that I would add is the particular example that I showed you, we had designated time zones around the world, but as we're thinking about the town hall that I was talking about in the first quarter of next year, we are planning that two time zones. So if you can target 8 o'clock in the morning and 8 o'clock at night, we can get a large percentage of our global population at that same time. Mm -hmm. I would say, though, from that moderated discussion, from our perspective, um, we're a little bit more reserved, um, and we're not at all opposed to the why are you doing that question. Um, but from a legal perspective, if employees bring, when you have 300,000 around the world, when employees bring up issues, if there's a legal obligation for dealing with different things in, in different ways, and the minute it goes public, um, even if it is in a controlled space, that's a, that's a bit of a concern for us. So in most cases, for the employee events, um, we moderate those. And that's not to say that we don't deal with um, the issues that come up, right? If someone comes in and, and and has a very serious allegation, that goes immediately to our legal partners. But we're not going to publish it live. Um, but we'll respond to them offline and say, look, we got your question. We understand your concern. And we are going to look into it and get back to you. We find that quite often with the health issues. And we deal with a lot of those. We don't advocate for employees to air their personal health issues uh, online. <laughs> um, but if they're having problems, 
you know, getting benefits covered, right? We'll deal with those. And we, and if they do air them publicly, we'll come back and tell, we'll even say, look, we're going to talk to you offline. Thanks so much for your concern. Um, if those, if those actually get there, but in that live conversation, we're a little bit, we're a little bit more conservative, more from a legal perspective. Next question. David Boyle with Oracle. Uh, I'm wondering, since we're talking about uh, live chat, talking about audience uh, participation in your events, that's one mode of getting feedback from your audience. Uh, another would be um, filing a service request with your IT teams that it's not working for me. What about the third option of uh, taking feedback from your audience in the form of uh, research and surveys internally. Do, do you survey your internal audiences uh, on the quality of user experience, uh, on feature requests, and things of that nature? General question for the panel. We do. Uh, I mean, we, we attach a survey to every single webcast. There's a, on our player, we have a, it's a tab that it's a survey, basically, you know, what do you think of the quality of the video? What was your overall webcasting webcast experience? And then we also we also used to to find out what they felt about the content of that particular town hall or whatever that webcast was. So um, yeah, we do it every time. Yeah, I'm not sure if we do it every time, but definitely for we have a quarterly broadcast for employees that follows our earnings broadcast again with our chief financial officer and, and his colleagues. And for each of those, um, because of the timely nature um, and because it's built into the system, it's easy for us to ask about the user experience. We we do the same. We do, we are we're um, pretty pretty uh, strict, I'd say, in terms of the surveys and how they go out. We get you know you probably get maybe fifteen percent of the responses back, but at least it gives you feedback. Um, it, it's always trying to push to say how we're going to try and make this better. We did notice early on when we started these, and and also when we started some of the chat feature that if at the beginning if people are experiencing a lot of technical issues, you know, I'm on this browser and I'm on wireless and I'm at my house and I'm at a Starbucks, whatever, and I can't get it, and go. The more of those chats that go out, right, people lose interest in, they're not actually listening to the content. They're more, I mean, you're more worried about what your problem is. I can't get the session. I can't see it. The lip sync is off. I'm not seeing the slides, you know, whatever it turns out to be. So that, the, what we love to see is when the initial chats start coming and people start saying, you know what, that, I, I don't know if that product's actually going to be on time. And they go, yes. We finally, they're starting to worry about the content. They're not worrying about the actual production of the event itself. So the faster that we can get people thinking about the content means that they, they're having an experience where they're starting to forget again about that technology. Technology is somehow delivering this experience to you. If you're watching the content, you're, you're in that meeting, right? You're paying attention to what those people are saying. You're not thinking, wow, I'm 10,000 miles away. That's what our goal is, right? Have them feel like they're sitting in that room with that presenter and that they're just they're experiencing it. So the, the faster that we can get through any of the technical problems that people have, and part of it is, you know, browsers, various versions of browsers. We're always chasing down something with that, right? Some, some different operating system somewhere that somebody's released that has some different browser on it. It's always a challenge. Right. And ours varies by the different service providers. They all have metrics that they're meeting, uh, so it, not typically rolled up in one place, but we do have metrics and ways for people to feedback. More questions? There's a couple up here. Yeah, go here first and then, and then you'll be next. How you doing? Great. Hey. I'm Antoine Holmes with uh, Disney ABC TV. Uh, how do you guys uh, restrict playback from different locations other than uh, your target location? So restrict, playback uh, no, restriction? No restrictions from our side. There's no restriction to playback. So with the uh, application content networking Do you mean how do, how do they keep the content Confidential within yeah, the firewall. Going, you know, I was at, uh, we're getting ready to do our town hall yep. next month, and you know, we're we're looking at some different uh, different avenues as well. And we, uh, in the past, we've done uh, refer based security. So I just want to know, see you know how you guys are, are doing it. Um, you know, except for you know, effectively, we you know we all sign a, a code of business conduct that says you know it's got to be thirty five pages probably, right? It says. These are, you know, you will not do, you know, don't be stupid, don't be, don't do things you shouldn't do kind of thing. There's some obviously more specific things in there that the lawyers have created around it. But there are no, there's nothing physical that would actually stop somebody from uploading something into YouTube if they wanted to. Okay. So, I mean, again, I mean, I, and that may be different. I mean, a lot of you out there depend on where, what companies you're with. Again, Cisco's Silicon Valley based company, the, you know, it doesn't tend to be very pedantic in terms of saying you will do this or you won't do this. It's a little bit more open. So it may or may not, you know, be relative to some of the companies that you all are with. 
Yeah, NASA is definitely all about security and protecting <laughs> IP. And I'm not launching rockets, so I, yeah. I, would, I want them to be that uh, way, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm all for it for NASA to be like that. So I mean, for, in, a, in our case, certainly people are trained, don't take a copy of this and upload it, and they know what's going to happen if they do. It, it, it's not a good outcome, and we don't have a lot of problems with that sort of thing. So mostly, if we don't want somebody to get to video, we prevent it at an IT level. Um, they just can't get to the computer that it's on, or if they do, they have to log in. You know, all of our people have credentials, and, and so we've got very good control on that. Um, well, we do it in a couple of ways. I mean, we can lock down based on Active Directory groups that are created, you know, internally. So um, we can kind of direct the traffic where that, you know, who's allowed to watch and that kind of thing. But for like general thing for our town hall meeting, means um, you know there's no way for them to download the video. At least not an easy way for them to download the video to their desktop and then send it up. But we tell everyone that there's no possible way for us to stop someone from recording it with their phone and putting it up. It this goes back to that managed expectations thing. We just have to let you know nothing is completely secure, and so um, that's kind of the way we handle it. I mean, if there are things that are said during the town hall that may concern someone legal or whatever, before we put it up on demand, we may do some editing and cut that stuff out, but, and cut that part out, and then, put, and then post it again. But that's kind of how we handle it. Our approach is fairly similar. It's pretty difficult for people to download and then upload in the systems that, that we mm -hmm. have, um, again, from a non-technical person. Um, but we also have a pretty um, open and honest kind of code of conduct that, you know, that people sign as well, similar to Cisco. Mm -hmm. So I would say both of those make us feel pretty comfortable. And I would probably add that from a communication standpoint and in general, we treat anything that we say internally um, as if it will be um, external someday. Um, and that, at least from a communications perspective, helps us deal with those. Not to say that we haven't you know, cut videos, I'm sure, to kind of reduce risk. Um, but our employees are pretty vocal, <laughs> either inside the firewalls or out, and so we always make the assumption that what we say internally could, could, go, could go external, and we prepare for any risks associated with that. So. Anytime your content goes to video, yeah. you have to assume that. Yeah. You, just, you just have to. Yeah, and it's not even necessarily circulating the video. Employees mm -hmm. talk, I mean, so many people know GE employees, mm -hmm. so it's not hard for even reporters or journalists, um, you know, to get in touch. We have relationships there that we hope, you know, they'll call us first, but um, managing, managing that side is, is really important to us. Question back here. I was just wondering if there's any, um, we handle communication within my company. I work for a real estate development company, and we handle communication. It's kind of like in two stages. One, one aspect is internally to employee communications, and the other one is externally to an outside audience. And I was just wondering if you guys have any words of wisdom of absolute do's versus don'ts of handling either internally to employees or externally to outside clients I guess I think I think the primary do or the primary do that that we've all stated is you know just assume that it's going to be outside at some point and know what people um, you know what's the company's story you know that if you can align your communications to the company's story that really helps people keep things in perspective and keep things real and and relevant to what people are saying that's that's what i'd say from the wells fargo side what any other i might just add to start internal you know i yeah. mean we find that you'll gain a lot of ground by having the conversation internally even if you are expecting it to go external mm -hmm. um and and just saying that you know you want them to be in the loop and what's happening and having that conversation first even if it's just for a few days we find makes a world of difference um, we've done it more and more recently with advertising, which sounds absolutely probably silly from a GE perspective. But GE employees, in, in general, really love the company. And so if they're sitting at home and they see the ad, they're excited to see it. But if they get to see it first and kind of a sneak peek, 
um, they feel really good, and then they're telling their friends about it. And so if you think about these 300,000 employees, you've turned what could be a, a negative into an immensely positive situation. And so thinking about, right, it's not always possible, right? I'm not going to lie. There are situations where we can't talk to employees except maybe like one minute before we talk externally. And understanding mm -hmm. those situations is definitely important. But when you can, use those opportunities to your advantage. Because what will happen with employees is that when you have a situation, maybe it's a merger and acquisition or something like that, when you can't talk to them all that long in advance, you can be really honest and say, look, we're giving you a five minute heads up. We can't give you any more because of legal situations, but this is, this is what we know now. And you kind of build that relationship um, that will work to you in the longer term, I, I think. It's just my, my Agreed. two Agreed. The, the large companies, uh, the hardest thing that we're all faced with is that, that one world concept, that we are all one company and that we're all in this thing together. And so how do you get that message across that whole one company? Well, you do it with you know integrated communications and you do it with a solid message that everybody knows you know, your vision and values and your stories and then you everything aligns to that and and that goes out to the world um, as a as a unified culture you know you, you get a sense of GE you get a sense of large companies like that and if you can find a way to build that in a smaller company it's it you can do it quicker mm -hmm. but it's a little bit harder because you, you know you have to employ the same methods of, of storytelling to do that so I believe we are out of time yeah, thank you very yeah. much. Thank you all. Help me thank the panel again for their hard work.